Hey Trinity community, it's Pastor Hemingway here. I pray that you are all healthy and well, and I want to thank you for joining me for this devotion today. I want to use a passage from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verses 11 and 12. Those verses say, And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. How comfortable are you at talking with others about Jesus? You know, if you're anything like me, you have some hang-ups about it. That might sound weird to hear from me because I'm a pastor, but it's true. Talking with others about Jesus when I'm not wearing a white pastor dress can be tough. You know, we get worried about different things. We have this anxiety about what somebody might think about us or Maybe we don't want to offend others, or maybe we're worried about what we're going to say. I know a lot of people who think, I don't want to say the wrong thing, I don't want to give somebody the wrong answer, and I'm just going to shut up instead. Maybe we're worried about getting into a fight if we open that door. There are a lot of reasons why we do get nervous about talking about our faith. In fact, I saw on one church's website an article that the biggest fear Christians have is related to to evangelism. Like I said, I get it. I've been there. But let me share something with you that has helped me get better at talking with others about Jesus. When somebody asks you about your faith, don't approach your answer in any way than to just tell them about what Jesus means to you, what he has done for you, and what you expect him to do in the future for you. You know, ever since I've taken that approach to talking with others about Christ, I've lost a lot of my anxiety about that. All I have to do is talk about my relationship with Him and what He has done for me through His death and resurrection. And you know what the cool thing about talking about Jesus that way is? Nobody can take away what He means to me personally. That belongs to me. And really... Only the most obnoxious, judgmental, arrogant so-and-sos will attack you for that, and for having that opinion and that belief. And if that's the case, guess who really has the problem? It's not you. It's them. So why do we worry about people who have huge issues and want to judge us? Don't waste your energy on their opinions. Instead, we ought to spend our energy as Christians thinking about the one who has called us to go and tell the world about him when we are asked. And from there, remember this. We're not just talking about any person who's told us to go. We're talking about Jesus. He is the Savior of the world. He is the one with all authority in heaven and on earth. He is the judge of the world. And he says he will be with his brothers and sisters as they go to the ends of the earth when they will go and talk to others about him. And he says that when we are talking to others, the Holy Spirit will be with us to give us strength to share that message. All he wants us to do is tell others about the amazing things he has done for us. That's what Paul did. That's what Peter did. That's what John did. And that approach, I think, makes talking about this a lot easier. It certainly does for me. And I hope it does for you, too. Because the people who don't know Jesus sure do need to know Jesus, don't you think? Check out this video from the Red Letter Challenge and see what Pastor Zender has to say about this concept. So we are entering into the fifth principle this week, which is going. And I guarantee you in the room right now, out of all the principles, this is the biggest struggle for most of you. So far in the Red Letter Challenge, we spent some time being with Jesus and instilling spiritual disciplines in our life. We spent some time receiving God's forgiveness and then giving that away. We spent some time serving our neighbors and our community, and we've even been generous towards those in need. But there is absolutely a time that God calls us to go and to speak and tell people of who He is and what He's done. And I think the reason most people think this is daunting and scary 
is quite simply because we think we need to know everything about everything about Jesus before we go and speak about him. Like we need a doctoral dissertation of who he is. But what God never asks you to do is to understand him completely. He asks you to trust him completely. Is it important we know a lot about our God? Absolutely, but I believe you can go today and help people know who Jesus is. And, and, and there's something that Jesus tells us. It's actually his very last words that I think is gonna give us a clue as to what Jesus is looking for when we're gonna go out and speak about what he's done. And it's from Acts chapter one, verse eight. Jesus says that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And that verse gives me a lot of comfort because it tells me two things. Number one, it tells me that I don't go alone. God's power, his Holy Spirit goes with me and he can speak through me. But actually the part that I want to clue in on that's even more important for this is that we are his witnesses. And that's what Jesus asks us to be. And when I think of witnesses, I think of our judicial system, I think of the courtroom. And so today you are joining me at a historic courthouse in Orlando, Florida. Jesus calls us his witnesses. And I wanna, I wanna show you how easy, but yet how powerful it can be to be a witness for Christ. And I don't know if you've noticed over the last couple of decades, there's been a lot of chatter about the reliability of eyewitness accounts in the courtroom. In fact, they've done study after study and they've found that jurors place more weight on eyewitness accounts than they do things like polygraph tests and even finger printing and handwriting evidence and kind of nuts in one sense that someone can just give their version of the story and jurors will put more credence on that than they will some factual tests and things. I was reading a story not long ago about a man from California. His name was Cash Register. No joke, cash with a K register. And he was wrongfully convicted of a murder that he didn't commit and had to spend a life in prison was his sentence. And there was very weak physical evidence in this case, but everything hinged on this chair right here, because this is where the eyewitness account gives their story. And in this particular case, and you can read through the articles if you'd like, there was a 19 year old woman that shared her version of the story and she lived nearby. And she talked about the things that happened and, and pretty much everything changed based on her story. And he was largely convicted because of this eyewitness account. He spent decades in prison and he kept continuing to proclaim his innocence. He had 11 parole hearings and every time he would declare his innocence, which isn't so good if you're trying to get out to still say you're innocent. And so it had been decades and this woman looked up his name in the system and saw that he was still in prison suffering. This woman just happened to be the sister of the woman that was 19 years old giving the eyewitness account and she always had suspicion that her sister was lying and not really telling the whole truth. And so as she was looking at the case and the facts, she got it reopened and was able to give her eyewitness account. And 34 years after he went to prison for murder, he was freed. And what's crazy about this story is from one woman's account, he was convicted. And from another woman's eyewitness account, he was freed. It goes to show you the power of the story and your witness and your testimony can have. The Bible talks in Romans 3 verse 10 that there is not a single one of us that's righteous. All of us are guilty. That we're all sinners and we're all falling short. And that the punishment for our sins, the wages of our sin is death. And so spiritually speaking, we are all walking around with these death sentences hanging above our heads. And that's the bad news, and that's what we walk around with. But the good news is that Jesus did not come to condemn the world. Jesus came to save the world. And Jesus took our punishment, our penalty, all the wages of all the sins that we've committed, and he went to the cross, and he died for you and me. That blood that he shed on the cross was blood shed for you and for me. So much so that now when, when God the Father looks at us, and the Bible talks about how He's our judge, that when He looks at us, He doesn't look at us through the lens of what we've done, the bad things that we've said or thought. Instead, He looks at us through the eyes of Jesus Christ and declares you and declares me not guilty, innocent, free. That death sentence has been removed. And now that your death sentence has been removed, Jesus invites you into a life where we get to go remove other people's death sentences. In fact, I love the way Revelation 12, 11 puts it. It says to overcome the enemy, in other words, to get rid of that death sentence, this is what it says. We overcome it by the blood of the lamb, 
That's the blood that Jesus has already spilled for us. And check this out. We overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. You who have been freed by God, you who have been rescued by God, have a story to tell of what Jesus has done for you. And that's all the witnesses. It's saying, hey, this is who Jesus is, this is what he's done, and this is the difference that it's made in my life. Your story can help remove other people's death sentences. You who have been freed, I pray you would go help free others with the Holy Spirit working inside of you.